Well, um, I was a student in Cambridge and um, one day there was a knock on my door in my rooms and there was this man in a very bright tie standing outside. And of course, I discovered that, that it was John Stott. And he was very concerned um, about me, about my future ministry, future work, and offered to help. Uh, well, at that time, um, I was being supported by my sending diocese and by the college and so forth. So there was no kind of need for financial help. But um, I was then recommended for postgraduate work. And um, there was some funding from the university. And by then I was married and Valerie, my wife, was working. So there was some funding from that source. But I still needed some funding. And so we approached John Stott. And uh, that is how uh, I came to be a Langham scholar. And then, of course, when we were working in Pakistan for a long time, John was always in touch with us, supporting, enabling, helping. I mean, for instance, the uh, Third World uh, Scholars Book Grant. Uh, I was teaching in a seminary at one time, and it came in very useful. And the books that I bought then with that grant, I still have and consult regularly. Uh, then, even with CMS, when I was working in other parts of the world, uh, John was always uh, very anxious to learn about the work and to support it. When I was uh, Bishop of Rochester, I began to receive requests from church leaders in different parts uh, of the world, um, nearly all of them asking how they could develop leadership in their churches, because very often when a church is persecuted or in difficulty, it's the leadership that suffers first. It's, it is um, the leadership that is exiled or imprisoned or even killed sometimes. Uh, and I've had some personal experience of that, of course, uh, in a small way. So I felt that was God's call. And um, so I began to prepare for the step in faith, which is very much what it is. All of us need to, to be learning more and more of the implications of the gospel for ourselves and for the world. And this is a lifelong journey. Uh, but two things um, can be said uh, about the situation here. Um, one is that because of this concern for saving souls, uh, Christians and churches are not often found in the marketplace, uh, at the workplace, uh, in the public square. Uh, at the time of the last general elections, uh, we were running a campaign simply to enable uh, biblical Christians to meet candidates. And under God, it turned out to be a very successful campaign. Um, I remember a meeting with the candidates in Durham where 450 Christian students turned up. And I mean, this was a surprise to the, to the candidates as well. But uh, a number of uh, evangelical church leaders said to us at the time, um, Bishop, they would say, um, you know, we are with you, you go and do this. Uh, but our task is uh, making new Christians and helping them develop in the faith and so forth. We'll pray for you. So that means that Christians then are absent from the world of education, uh, from questions uh, being raised in the medical world, uh, from questions being raised in, in politics, in public life generally. Um, and this is one of the reasons why Christianity has been seen as irrelevant, because, you know, we simply haven't been there. The second point to make is more about the kind of um, what you might call um, broad brush, liberalish, um, Anglican uh, Christians, uh, the Church of England, where uh, there is a great desire to serve the nation, 
to provide facilities for people in churches, uh, to have volunteers doing a whole host of things that no one else would do if they didn't do them. But there's nothing value added to that. There's uh, no gospel value adding anyway. So uh, people accept those services uh, gladly, of course, why shouldn't they? Uh, they use the facilities, but they never hear the gospel. And so I think there is a great need in that sort of area to make sure that whilst we are serving people, uh, that we are also providing a link so that they may somehow hear the good news also. I think we have to be prepared um, for difficulty, for discrimination, for exclusion from public places, from public life, from certain professions. Um, and that is happening already. Uh, people are losing their jobs because of Christian conscience, uh, because they cannot be party, for instance, uh, to advice given without reservation for women to have abortions without considering other alternatives. Uh, if they refuse to officiate at a civil partnership ceremony, they will lose their job uh, as registrars. Uh, and that may also happen if if gay marriage becomes law. Uh, that will happen, no doubt. Adoption agencies have had to close. Uh, people have been struck off professional registers uh, because they insist on a biblical view of human relationships. Uh, there will be problems about um, uh, questions uh, regarding the end of life. You know, when is... Um, assisted suicide exactly that and sometimes it can be called something else so Christian professionals in, in that area will have trouble uh, if they discern that what is being asked of them is contrary to God's word and God's will um, the dilemma is how to uh, continue contributing in the public place, uh, but at the same time uh, to make sure that we have churches that are clear Christian communities that attract people by their Christ-likeness. Um, on the one hand, we don't want to become a sect that is completely cut off from the rest of the world. On the other hand, I think it will be more and more important to be clear what we feel is God's will for human flourishing. Uh, and that balance will be more and more difficult to maintain. There are all sorts of things to say. First of all, that secularism is not as popular as it makes itself out to be. Uh, it is highly organized, and that is what may make it seem more influential than perhaps it should be. Uh, when I go to education fairs and um, conferences of those kinds, you find the secularist lobby highly organized and present, but the Christian is not, and I think we've got to learn something from that. Um, Secondly, secularism is a worldview. It is not neutrality. I mean, this is one of these things that we've got to nail, finally, that it is as much a worldview as any other worldview, including the Christian. Uh, and so the question then becomes of competing uh, rights, of competing places in society, and I'm very happy for people of any kind uh, to have freedom to express themselves um, uh, as long as it is clear that Christians also should have such freedom. Uh, that is not what has happened uh, recently. I mean, the long tradition of conscientious objection and respect for that in British law, uh, well, we've not found that in recent, for example, equality or hate speech legislation. Um, We've also not been very good at uh, reasonable accommodation for conscience. Um, 
even the Abortion Act, and I'm not a great fan of it, but even that recognized a place for conscience. But now it seems there isn't very much room, uh, certainly for Christian conscience, and um, that will be a great loss to society because uh, that will mean that highly motivated people will not be found in precisely those areas of need and of service where they ought to be found. It is certainly the case that um, people in our churches uh, are not deeply discipled, uh, generally speaking. Their knowledge of the Bible, even if it exists, is not um, systematic. Uh, so they know bits and pieces of the Bible story, but, but not the thrust of what the Bible says. Uh, in particular areas of human relationships, for instance, how to deal with the state, um, how we should use our money, I mean, all of those things. So I think there is a great need for a systematic, providing people with a systematic knowledge of the Bible, and that may also extend to people who are in full-time ministry. Um, John would, of course, have been the first to say that uh, we are acceptable to God because of the perfection of Christ's righteousness. Uh, but the righteousness that we have, uh, our righteousness, which is real and which comes about because we accept what Jesus has done for us, uh, is never perfect in this world. Uh, it is always imperfect, and it's growing, hopefully, under God's uh, guidance, but it's not perfect. Um, and so, uh, one of the things that we must do constantly, constantly, is to point to Christ, and not, not to ourselves. Uh, I mean, in the great sort of sexuality debates that we've had, I've always said in public, we are all fallen creatures, uh, Christians, um, are also sinners, although by the grace of God, uh, with a righteousness that uh, hopefully is, is real and growing. Uh, all of our um, sexualities are fallen, and we start, you know, we don't start from some kind of moral high ground. Uh, we share in that human condition. Uh, but what the gospel tells us is that we can turn to God, uh, we can repent of what is wrong or where we've fallen short, uh, and um, um, ask God to, um, to change us, to transform us, if you like, uh, in a way that corresponds to his purpose as it has been revealed in Jesus Christ. Um, so um, that, of course, is where the sticky bit is. I mean, that is what people don't want you to say. Uh, but repentance, I insist, uh, and have insisted in public, is a good word. It means starting again. It means being willing to change and to develop as a person. Um, and there is opportunity for everyone to do that. We should never be complacent. Uh, I mean, Christians should never seek martyrdom. Uh, if it comes, well, uh, and it has come in many places. Also, um, we should not be um, easily uh, led into thinking that persecution will always result in the growth of the church. This has not been the case historically in North Africa, a dominant church that provided uh, so many of the great teachers uh, for the church was simply wiped out by uh, the Islamic conquests. But the, the present day uh, situation is a mixture, I think. Um, in Algeria, for instance, there is now a vibrant evangelical church which simply wasn't there, um, say, 30 years ago. Um, there is de-Christianization, as you call it, in some parts. Uh, in Iraq, for instance, um, a third to a half of the Christian population left during the Troubles. Some are now coming back because they had fled to Syria, and of course <laughs> the situation in Syria is now worse than the situation in Iraq. Um, so some are coming back. 
Uh, I do feel that there is a need for some international protection for Christians as there was for the Kurds and the Marsh Arabs. I mean, why not for the Christians in that particular country? Um, but I think there is also what you might call a new Christianization. Uh, more people have become Christians uh, of Irani origin, both inside and outside Iran, than they did before the revolution. Um, there are new sorts of Christian communities, as I was saying, from all over the world and places like Turkey. Um, we do not yet realize the full significance of, of what is happening, but it is a very mixed situation. Thank you.